all smiling faces, which is good. I like the fact that the subject so far of the thing has been here. Would you like to hear a mean joke? Maybe. We'll tell you after. We'll tell you after. Okay, cool. <laughs> While I set this up, let me tell you a beer joke. So, um, three little biddies go to a restaurant and the, the uh, waiter comes up to take your order and says, What do you want to drink? So, the first little biddy says, I'll have Coke. Second little biddy says, I'll have Sprite. And the third little biddy says, I'll have lots of beer. So, anyway, the waiter comes back a little while later and says, I'll main course, guys. What are you going to have? First guy says, I'll have, first little biddy says, I'll have steak. Second one says, I'll have risotto. The little piggy says, I'm going to have lots of beer. So we go through that course, the dessert guy comes up and says, what are you going to have for dessert? The first guy says, I'll have ice cream. The so little piggy says, I'm going to have a little green pie. The third little piggy says, I'm going to have lots of beer. So the guy stops and he says, well, I'm going to ask why you have lots of beer for your drink, lots of beer for the main course, lots of beer for the dessert. You don't look like you're part of the beer, but can I ask the reason why you've got ordering lots of beer? And the guy says, well, some little piggy's going to go, wee, 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 all the way home. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Let's not do that joke then. Right. Uh, my name is Shane Wilson. I'm from Absence. I'm here to help. Uh, I'm going to go through today just a few uh, quick bit of intro and talk a little bit about performance and security on Horizon View 6, uh, specifically when we talk about RDSH. Also applies to traditional view. But is um, anyone looking to deploy RDSH on Horizon 6? Hands. That nothing's looking around going in one hand. Um, anyone using view out there? One guy, couple. Okay, cool. cool. Okay, so we'll make this really interactive as well. Hopefully, um, if you've got any questions, feel free to jump up and ask. Uh, I'm going to do some demos later, which will be uh, some demos of our latest technology. So hopefully, it'll be something that you get some some value out of. So a quick overview of what AppSense. What I'm going to do first. I promise, very quick. Then some intro to talk about some of the challenges that people typically see in RDSH. And those, uh, those challenges will be, I would imagine, a random uses as well. So there'll be things that are, that are very uh, apparent. Um, do some demos and questions. And I've got a special beer offer at the end, at the end again. I put this in advance. I didn't know the thing was going to be here. But, um, so I've got a special beer offer at the end for anyone who's after a special accents beer coaster and a free beer. Right, so a quick overview of AppSense. We're a UK software company, uh, headquartered out of the UK. We've been in this region for a bit over 10 years. I've been with the company for uh, just over 10 years. I look after a pre sales uh, team for this region. We uh, turn over around about uh, 10 million, 20 million, something like that per annum. Out in this region, we've got around about 600 customers now. When I started, we had uh, six. Uh, they didn't tell me that before I did the job, but that's good fun. Um, so we've got about some of the customers here now, about 20 staff. Um, last two and a half years we've grown from 8 staff to 20. So some massive growth recently. All around traditionally desktop security and things like that. I'll talk about that in a minute where customers are using that technology. Uh, lots of customers across lots of different uh, demographics. We've got some customers on training and fails, some, some of our technology inside. Uh, we've got a few customers around the room probably. So lots of different um, vertical markets that we work in and large customers all around the world. So what are we with the management interface that lives between the user, their apps and their data? So typically we will manage uh, people's application settings, those sort of things, their window settings, their app settings, make sure they get a consistent look and feel. Uh, it's all about speeding up things like logging times, helping with data migration, that sort of thing uh, is where we fit typically. We also have a data play, which is a very, very simple way of getting internal AV users access to internal data. It doesn't do cloud or anything like that. If you want to do cloud, you have to do something else. We just do a really simple data play, and uh, it's quite effective what it does, but it's not for everyone. People are like it, though. So, three of the things that we typically do when we see a lot of work in the in the market here, and that's why we've grown so rapidly, things like uh, virtual desktop projects, Reducing the hardware required, so that's uh, from managing things like CPU and memory. I'll show you how that works in the tick. And that has enabled us to, in some cases, get up to 40% reduction in hardware required for the same number of guests and the same number of users. So that's been quite quite a good saving for a lot of our customers. Uh, I was over in um, 
the US the Department of Defense doing some testing before they bought their 100,000 seat uh, VI platform, and that was the sort of reduction that we showed them was something like 30% less hardware. When you buy 100,000 seat 30% less kit is uh, quite a good saving. So we can show that. Licensed compliance, something we'll talk a little bit about. Very important when you go into RDSH and VI rule that you uh, make sure that you're compliant with the vendor's licensing rules. Good old Microsoft and um, Adobe are typically the ones we get called in for quite often, just to make sure people are making sure that they've got their license sorted out. Um, nobody wants to have a client or a customer or be part of a license audit and then with a very large bill. This is something that you need to be mindful of. Uh, implementation rollout, making that sure that's part of those sort of things. There's a lot of things there. The other thing that we'll talk about a bit is uh, things like desktop security. Anyone interested in security in general? Yep. Anyone looking to roll out things like whitelisting? Is that something that's on people's agendas? Yeah. Get rid of local admin, something that people want to do. I suppose a lot of you guys are at the server back end, I suppose, and security whitelisting on the server back end is still a subject that's, that's around quite a bit as well. So talk a little bit about that, and I think it will be welcome to you guys. A uh, quick overview of what we have as far as products, if you like. Over here, you've got uh, application management, their security product. Very simple, runs the Windows world, it's got an agent, uh, allows you to do a very simplified form of whitelisting, very easy to manage. Gets rid of local landing, so you can elevate particular apps or functions for users, so that's quite cool. Uh, does the Microsoft license control, Adobe license control. It's got a thing called AAC, which a lot of people are using, banks and large corporates are using to control external contractors. So when the contractor comes in, they get a VMware View desktop. They can then only talk to certain network resources based on who they are, what group they're in, where they're coming from, those sort of things. Quite cool technology. Uh, performance manager there, CPU of memory, pretty simple stuff. Just manages the CPU of memory resources inside a guest. This is the key with that product, is that it works inside a guest. You've got your uh, ESX layer, which is going to manage your resources from a host point of view. What you need though, if you've got particular users that like to do double stuff, You've got to have something sitting right with the user inside their guest platform, inside their virtual desktop, or inside their RDSH session. Uh, you've got to make sure you can granularly manage those resources for that user to make sure they don't get a poor experience themselves or affect anyone else. Okay, I'll give you a show you how that works. And then we've got environment management, which is probably our most complicated product if you like. It's all about policy and personalization. If you think about this as a really intelligent triggering engine. So you can do pretty much anything. Um, just recently released uh, two weeks ago, and our latest version of that product is called 8.5. There's some very cool new features in that that I'll show you in a couple of uh, busy uh, hardy trick type demos we'll do. So hopefully that will be something of interest. And you know, two other platforms in data analysis, data that I mentioned. We do have a mobility platform. It's quite specialised, and uh, we do a little bit of that here and there. It's not something we terribly focus on this region. Okay, so let's have a look at uh, Horizon View 6 and RDSH. Does everyone know that that's come out and been released? I'm sure these guys have kept you up to date. Uh, so it gives uh, organisations that are using Horizon the ability to just deploy apps from a shared back end or deploy, deploy um, RDSH sessions rather than using a view desktop. Anyone know one of the reasons why you might want to do that? Simple app publishing, yeah. Tying multiple platforms to the one kind of authentication broker. Yeah, because you can mix everything in the one workspace if you like. People can get their apps in the different sessions from that one workspace. Anyone else from a, suppose the licensing question, anyone else from a licensing point of view? It's a Microsoft licensing challenge that you get that varies between virtual desktop and RDSH. Anyone know that one? Supply, yeah. So you, technically you're not really allowed to give someone a desktop OS as a service. You can, however, give them an individual uh, Windows 2008 or 2012 server as a desktop. No problem. You just can't give them Windows 7 or Windows 8. That's a Microsoft license. So when you go down the track where you can do RDSH, it allows you to get around that barrier. It allows you to implement those things with, I suppose, a more cost effective way, it just depends on the scenario. 
It's always been horses, of course, it's always will be. And then we scour each one of the virtual desktop rules significantly better. And then we scour each where, you know, doing an RD safe session is going to be more suitable for the customer. Okay? Just depends. We've got, you know, a mix of all sorts of installations from plain TS to uh, that C word, which I saw on one of your brochures, so you can probably say that. So those, those sort of installations, and then you've got RDSH uh, installations coming down the track as well, uh, across access across the board. So we're quite a well versed in all of those technologies. So we had a shared desktop where required, uh, allows for hosted desktops, all hosted apps, then just VCO and and uh, view connection broker. So you're going to use the same connection broker you've got for view, you're just going to use a part of your stage sessions. So what are the challenges going to be? You're going to be the same sort of challenges that we typically get right here, say, because you're going to be trying to solve the challenges that are in the underlying platform. This is not something that, um, you know, arises as added as a challenge. This is the challenge of the underlying platform. So resource sharing. So CPU memory, same as traditional TS, uh, BI RDS, you've got to make sure that a user is going to be isolated and that something that they do that's very dumb is not going to impact other users. Because we're all on shared resources. It's like having shared storage. If you've got someone who's hammering in storage, potentially they're going to impact other people who are sharing the same storage. Okay, so this is the sort of thing you, you need to look at and need to think about. Also licenses, Microsoft, Adobe, others, uh, same as the traditional TSV I world. Uh, there's a link to a, a um, an article on Microsoft's site called Pinpoint, which just talks about the fact that they recognise AppSense to be a valid form of license control, so we can solve that challenge. And then end user experience migration and consistency. Um, I've been having to talk to a couple of people lately about uh, desktop as a service, if you like. One of the things that people quite often forget is that if your user currently has something that they're using and you want to give them a brand new desktop as a service, you really have to get from point A to point B. And in a lot of cases, I want to go backwards to point B again from point A. They might have a laptop, they're not always going to use that remote desktop. So you want to have some method of having, having that ability to go backwards and forwards. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's the sort of thing that we do. A lot of migration and consistency of that experience to the user. And if you go to our website, go to find a case study, find a case study to pretty much cover any of that scenario. <coughs> So, what we're going to do is some questions. Yeah, has anyone got any questions before I start off? No? Anyone got anything they particularly want to see? Stud songs. Yes? Performance. Everyone loves performance. It's cool. Right. Let me jump to there. Do that. Right. Let's have a look at performance. Some stuff, something nice and simple. Um, what the spot is, just let me just, uh, just bring this up. Grab, uh, always a bit of a challenge when you get the uh, small screen device. So I'm going to do something fairly simple here. Let me just make sure I've got the right box there. You know. Right, so uh, what I'm going to do is go in here and do that. Right, so I've got here my little laptop. My laptop's quite right here. It's got four. Cores, if you can see that. So it's 16 gig of RAM. Um, it's got one of those funky SSD disks that goes quite well. But uh, CPU is always going to be a challenge. Now, if I want to cause a bit of a performance problem on this box, all I can do is bring up a good old calculator. Just place it over there. You can try this at home, it works very well. Put in five lines, then click on this little button here called Factorize. Watch what happens to my number one CPU, which is my top right. So the calculator is going to spin off, it's going to take that CPU up to 100%. And after two seconds, our performance manager probably is going to kick in and start trimming that back. Now the calculator process is just going in the background. What I've told our software is when you see calculator in the background, I want you to take it off CPU 1, which is the top right, and put it on CPU 3, which is the bottom right. And in that scenario, I want you to flatline it at 20%. Okay? Now it comes back to the foreground like we just did, it's going to go up. Going to go on to CPU 1, flatline it for a little while, and then we're going to start to trim it back so the CPU never locks up at 100%, and then the calculator process finishes. So, what we're able to do at a very granular level is we're able to control how much CPU the process has, we're able to control which 
core room operates on in this sort of scenario, you're probably not going to do that to virtualize wood, just going to leave it on across two cores where we've got. But you do want to control the CPU and make sure there's some free CPU there available inside that guest OS for that application to use and that user to get some uh, response from. In the TS world, when you have that sort of challenge happening, every user that's hooked up to that core will start to go into a CPU queue, CPU queue length issue, and you'll start to get delays. Yes? Performance in a high latency environment. Performance in a high latency environment? Um, high latency environment is all going to be determined by a network. Okay, so our technology doesn't do anything about the network performance and the network latency. We're all about backing post. Okay. So just to show you that um, quickly, I'll see if I can keep this guy. Actually, we'll be right on the background instantly. So he goes straight down. So as soon as I minimize that, you're going to see it goes down the bottom. It's going to get flat on about 20%. It'll just sit there processing. Now, you don't get anything for free. If I have that using 20% of the CPU, that's obviously going to take longer to run as a calculation. Okay? But if you're talking about shared resources, when you're talking about a terminal server, if I've disconnected and I've kicked off something that's doing a lot of resources, I don't want them taking 90% of the CPU if I've disconnected. I don't want them taking 90% of the CPU if I'm looking for a coffee. Okay? So under either of these other scenarios, we're able to do that uh, with access, we're able to make sure that we can uh, use the resources that the user is actually interacting with the box and make sure anyone who's not interacting with the box is not wasting a lot of resources. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. A few nodding heads. <coughs> okay, now what's the other big thing that we want to manage in as far as performance goes? What's the other big kicker? Memory. Memory. Exactly. So let's go down here. And let's uh, pick on my favourite little memory block, which is called so what I'm going to do here is just uh, do what a typical user does. Hard, 
hard line it to 20%, so you can hard limit it, and then chuck it on the CPU frame. So we'll pull that process off one CPU, pop it on the other CPU, and then we'll put it in a flat line. So I only want it to have more than 20%. Now we can do both soft limits and hard limits. So a soft limit, a good example to think about is something like a backup application. If it's the middle of the night, you want your backup application to use, until it's good, it's going to use all the CPU it wants. But if that backup continues to go and then the user stuff the here, what you want to be able to do is trim that back and say, I don't want the backup routine using lots and lots of CPU while I've got users on the box. So that's when you get in the soft limit and we'll start to crank it down. Yes? Why would you uh, use CPU affinity if you're trying to constrain to one CPU, or is the Windows allocation suboptimal? Um, Return suboptimal, I like that suboptimal too. Um, Windows, a lot of people have this impression that Windows, um, Microsoft Windows has built in performance tuning, uh, it's a bit of a fallacy. The way Windows allocates threads and processes, it works in a random model. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. If you happen to go and flat channel CPU, so you, let's say you, you caused an issue on CPU 1, um, Microsoft doesn't care, Windows doesn't care. Windows goes 0, 1, 2, 3, so what happens on CPU 1 is that CPU sitting 100%, CPU Q length will start to scale out because all the processes that are waiting on that CPU will just sit in the queue to that particular. Um, CPU likes to, you know, let itself go. Now, just to back it up, you guys are really, I'm not talking to super team, you guys are really super team. Let me, uh, let me bring this back up and explain one other thing. One of the things that's also suboptimal in the Windows world is the thing called the schedule. Any uh, Unix guys in here? There's a few good, right? I'm an old school Unix guy as well. Um, there's a thing in Windows called the schedule. There's a schedule that's sitting in uh, Unix as well. The one in Unix, generally speaking, is pretty good. Flavor you've got varies a little bit, it just depends. But uh, the one in Windows is to put it, you would say suboptimal, I would say pretty crap. Um, so the problem with that is that everything in the Windows world, if I turn off our software, all of these processes will go to what's called the normal base priority. Now the challenge with the Windows schedule is that if I have a process that jumps on my CPU and my little time slice comes up, the scheduler says, hey, get off, it's the end of your time slice. In the Windows world, when it goes to look at the next thread that wants to get on, if they're both the same base priority, the Windows schedule has a heart attack. It says, ah, I can't make a decision to both the same priority. So what our software does is, on a, I suppose, CPU cycle by CPU cycle basis, you can see it happen there. See how this one says low? The more CPU your process uses, the lower its, its base priority is going to be. And the less CPU it uses, the higher its base priority going to be. So anything that gets on and starts hogging the CPU is going to get a low base priority. Anything that doesn't use the CPU, sorry about that, anything that doesn't use the CPU is going to have an above normal. So when the scheduler tries to make a decision, one's on low, one's on above normal, it's very simple for it to say, you're out and the other guy's in. And the effect for the user is you can very quickly swap processes without any delay. Okay, if you don't believe you get onto a single CPU box, do that calculator thing, lock up the CPU, then try and do anything else. Rather than just sit there. Okay, because we know it's get locked up. You can't keep that process on because everything else is the same base priority. So what we're doing in that sense is we're just, I suppose, helping the scheduler make decisions by changing the basic priorities artificially for it. Okay, if that makes sense. We have papers around the fairness. Yep. The resources, which is Correct. It's a similar sort of thing. And you guys, I imagine you guys are doing that in the host level. Right? We're doing it actually inside the edge. Okay? So we're the use of this. So if you do it at the host, you can only do it at the host level, you treat the entity as a guest. Yeah, the views are completely different. Yeah, the views are different is exactly the views are completely different. Um, when we sit beside the user again, we can do things a lot more granular. And um, I suppose it becomes quite effective like that. Okay, as you can see, I've got um, some processes in here, I've got some virtual machine um, processes that I'm actually managing as well. This, I mean, the job of this laptop is to do demos, so I want my virtual machine to run very fast. And I want to you know, potentially browse the run okay, and I want my demos to work. So that's pretty much what I do. Uh, this little thread trolling setting here, this shows you, I suppose, a view of what CPU will look like if something takes it to 
So after it sits half percent for two seconds, we're going to clamp it by five percent. I'm going to clamp it for ten seconds, and then we're going to release it. So you're going to get these little clips. So for ten seconds, we'll clamp that process down so you get five percent free CPU. After ten seconds, we're just going to release it. Get that little blip, and if it tries to go to one percent again, we're going to clamp it straight away. Our software can give you a list of which users are causing the problem, which processes are causing the problem. And that's been quite handy for a lot of customers in working out where their performance issues come from. from the okay. Yes? See, that, that's the most important thing for smaller businesses as well, to know what the issues are prior to implementing the rules and the templates. Yeah. Um, do you guys have sort of uh, pre-made templates depending on the business size so people can scale it for them? Uh, we do have pre-made templates. They're pretty much the best practice template if you like. So when I started this console up, I'll just start it up again and you'll see the uh, templates come up. So when you start off our console, it'll come up with these templates. Okay, so there's a general purpose one, there's a physical desktop one, there's a terminal server RDS one. You just hit the button. There's a video on one, tick the button. And then pretty much be our best practice. You might need to adjust a couple of things. Like on tune it. Typically, you just leave those templates to start. And then if somebody's got a particular app, yeah. we'll need to fine tune that. Yeah. So I presume you can do thresholds to allow you if the usage is in specific app that's sort of running the system. Um, one of the things that's very different about this software from normal monitoring is because we're about really monitoring software. It's sort of, but I'm trying to think of ways to be more proactive. So yeah. as soon as you realise that something's going wrong, it's informing you. So you're going to find yeah. more Well, I'll give you an example that we've used for years is that uh, we've been implemented for for years. Is uh, sometimes you get a schooler uh, rogue driver that will wrap up a schooler. Yeah. So the schooler will, will go rogue. And what happens then is it flashes the CPU. Now, if you talk about a terminal server box, it still goes rogue. Typically, what happens is the thing runs like a pig. And the help desk guy gets a call saying, hey, what's going on? Right? And he gets one call from a guy saying, where's my picture? Right? So, what our technology can do, we can set those limits as I said before on that process and say, I want the schooler never to have more than 30%. But when it hits that threshold, I want you to send an email to support to say support at company name, to say, hey, this is server X, Y, Z, you need to come and reset this block. Now, without that sort of measure, what happens is, as I said, the guy gets 50 calls and one person wants the print job. He tries to connect to the box, it's running like a pig, so it takes him 20 minutes to log in, and then eventually he's able to reset this block. Okay. Uh, when you have performance manager controlling that, he gets an email to say, hey, come and reset this block. He logs straight in because the performance we manage. The box won't be locked up, the users won't know there's a problem, you'll still have one person who has got a print job, but that's the only call he's going to get. Then he can get in and very quickly reset this call once the problem goes away. So I agree with what you're saying, it's, it's, it's important to notify people when you have those things happen. But our software will proactively fix the problem. It won't just lag and say, hey, there's a problem here, you need to come and fix it. It will proactively fix it and then it can tell you that it's done that. Okay. Any more questions on that? Running web server and SQL Express, if 
tonight as the bagging of assets. So that's collecting information. So those auditing events we talked about just before, they're all collected in SQL database. You can run SQL report right and do whatever you want. Uh, the front end here, I've got a virtual desktop running Windows 7. And what I wanted to show you is just a couple quick for the simple um, security things. Just from that point of view, and then we could uh, have a little bit of hard tricks with your own fun, just to finish off. So from the security point of view, uh, this user here is logged on as a standard user, so when you send it as the username, they're going to run something like task manager, just going to get the user thing, click on that button, UAC kicks in. So this guy's not got any admin privileges. So if I want that guy to be able to run that application with admin privileges, I can just add it in. So in that and grab the policy. So what that's going to do is it's going to say, if you're this user, and you run task ngr.exe, it's going to apply that policy to it. You want to look at that policy. What it says is, I'm going to aggregate you to the local admin group. Now, it doesn't go mucking around with the user groups or anything like that. Every time you start the process in Windows, it goes to get a ticket from the LSASS service, and that ticket has your rights. All we do is we grab the ticket. We do, if you like, a man in the middle of the table, the ticket. We just write in, hey, uh, I'm going to add in your local admin. So that's pretty neat, but it's the way it works. And we're able to give that to the app so that the app has a ticket that can't be used for anything else. It's only that app that's got that ticket. So once I save the link, I say save as live coffee. That's going to be active. I'm going to go on task manager this time. It just works as a live level. Okay, so that process got full admin rights. But because I didn't tick box down here, Control processes, I need to tick that box. You don't need to do that, so leave that unticked by default. If I go up here and go file new task, that new task is just going to run not as an admin, just have standard privileges. Okay. So that can do all of that. Um, can't get around this by you know, running two copies of it. It's more like that. So nice and simple. The other thing we can do is we can let people self elevate. So you may have some users who occasionally need to run stuff that need admin rights. We can allow them to do that if we trust them. So I'll just take that task manager out. Just remove that. And then save that copy away. Save as live. So if I go and grab that down, you can see that still runs with the normal privileges, just low level. If I click on the box, UAC still kicks in. But what I'm able to do now is run the bagging lights. Comes up and says you will be audited. So the user knows it's going to be audited. Clicks on that. Comes up and says, hey, please provide the reason. Um, you can be audited. If you lie to us, you know where you live. I'll you up. So I'll just demo the demo. Continue. Now comes your bad advice. So the user gets that option to, to put that in, but he knows he's being audited. He knows somebody's going to be looking at it, that sort of stuff. Now, in our latest version, we also released this ability. Request access rights for this app. If the user clicks on that, actually go grabs the username, grabs the name of the exe, uh, and they can put in a request. They can either um, put me anytime big work for a poly change at uh, one hour packet. So they can ring up, they give the admin staff the request code, he types it into an interface, he gives them a response code, click on the button, runs the app. Okay? So they can do that if they want. So many customers want to do that, so many customers say, I want to be talk to them this anyway. Just the things, all simple courses. Okay, pretty cool. That's the feature we've just released. Jack? How yeah, granular is this option? So if you had Explorer, are you using your stamp Windows Explorer? Yep. And you have a SIF span, can you give specific users orders of access to a SIF span, which is normally secured off? Um, Unix instead of through uh, AD? No. no. Won't do that because that, that's more of a rights to a, a resource if you like. This is more about either an executable or maybe an area of control pattern. Uh, well, the thing is that the visibility is there from Windows and from 
AD, but it's just that it's not normally secured from there. AD does have an overriding authority on that. Yes, and we won't override that. Right. So even though even though I might allocate task manager for that user, that doesn't mean if they try and do something from task manager to a file share or a folder, that won't they won't try and do that as an admin. They're still the user. Okay, so they'll still inherit the user rights of that folder if you like, if that makes sense. Okay, so this is more talking about the process, and in this case here, you grab things like you know, bits of the control panel you can open, for example, tick the box of date and time for that user, and if I save that away and say, save as like config, when that guy goes into date and time, it puts the button, and then it works. Okay. So the, the reason I've asked this is because the workaround was to use something like Filezilla, and you could bypass security through files who are into the system here. Yeah, well, we, we wouldn't be able to help you with that because as I said, we're talking about folder permissions there. Uh, anytime you're on about Explorer, I'll put better off. Um, you may as well just make it happen. Well, the other option is to lock down files who are. Yeah. So that, yeah. Okay, so that's a couple of things about security. I've got about uh, 10 minutes left. Is that well? Five, 10 minutes? Yeah, cool. Five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you know. Okay, I'll tell you what I'll find this later. Okay, let me do a couple of, uh, couple of things. We talked a little bit about um, how app settings can help users get a consistent look and feel for their apps. Uh, this particular user here he is running what's called the temporary profile, so that means every time they log out, the profile goes off. They don't have a working profile, they don't have a local profile, they have what's called the temporary profile. Okay, Microsoft does that. If you've ever logged into Microsoft that can't access your real profile, you get this message saying, Hey, I've created a temporary profile for you. I'm sure everyone who's ever logged in with PC pretty length of time has got that. Um, every time you log out with that, it will dead set blast it away. There is no way you leave anything behind. Okay, so we use that as a very quick way of getting users a fast login, but also being an the system login if you like. Now the trick when you look at things like view and those sort of technologies is the cheapest way to run those technologies is using non systems. Right? You need to make sure you have a slab of architecture customize it for the user, keep their stuff that you want to keep, so the next time they come into the brand new desktop, they have exactly the same experience. Okay. So these settings here from my Excel spreadsheet here are actually managed by assets, they're not in a profile. So I've got a little whole kidney folder that get on with you guys little techies because I'm going to show you stuff, I'm going to show you some customer, that was going to um, So what I've got here is I've got my office settings sitting in that little folder, that little big folder. So I close that office, and Excel and delete those settings. The next time I run Excel, you can see those settings pop back. What happens is when I launch that app, app settings is hooked under every app that we're managing, and it says, hey, I need this user settings to Excel. Let me go and talk to the web server again from the database, stream it down so we can then start the app and the user's got his settings. Okay. Now, the cool thing about that is those settings live in a database, so if the user has an issue with Outlook or any other app, they can ring up and say, hey, it's screwed up on me. The help desk guy can say, was it working yesterday? Yes, it was. Okay, give me a username, give me the app name. He goes into our database, into the interface, and he says, click restore to yesterday, he rolls back just the Excel settings to yesterday settings. Okay? So that's why I think we call that personalization, quite cool technology. We've been doing it now for about uh, six or seven years. Uh, it works really well. Now, one of the other things we've got great granular control of, as I said, is policy. So, you can see when that uh, starts up, that Excel spreadsheet starts up and it's black or red in the background. Okay. With uh, the power of AppSense policy, what I can do is I can grab anything I like and link it as a rule. So if I create a text file on this one, I call that blue for example, when I start Excel, it's now blue. Okay. I'll close that down and delete the file. Start. It's now black. So what I've done there is I've linked the starting of that application to another element that may not be related to it. Okay? So I've said every time you start Excel, I want you to go and check the desktop. file. If you see a file there called blue, I want you to start Excel and make it blue. If you don't see the file there, make it black. Okay? So practical implementations of that, quite often we do this in things like browsers where you might need a browser configured differently. If it's talking to site A, I need to configure it like this. If it's talking to site B, I need to configure it like this. The guys on the local area network configure the browser with the proxy and all this stuff. 
If he's off the local area network, when you start the browser, reconfigure it, change the registry key, sort this out, bring the proxy in, or delete the proxy, and make it start totally different based on where the user is and what they're doing. Okay. So let me just show you quickly to finish off that config. So that is our environmental console, if you like. Now, this is, uh, you guys actually are the first ones that I've demoed our brand new console to. So one of the things we've added there is this little building up here, which is very cool. So as part of the logging process, we're able to set up some variables and stuff pre-session before the user logs on. Before they get a desktop, we can go and do all sorts of things. So I've got a couple of little measures in there to say, hey, if it's on Windows 7, I want you to go and set these shortcuts up. If it's on Windows 8, I want you to do something different in a different location. Okay? So that's pre-desktop, and then we can do other things after the desktop is created. So I can put a node in there and say, right, and now after the desktop is created and the guy's already logged in, go map this drive, set this trigger as the default, whatever you want to do. Okay. Now I've got a wide range of rules and conditions here, so I've got things like, you know, does the folder exist, the file exists, you've got your standard AD directory membership, you've got computer stuff in there, we've got a new rule which is putting, is it VDI? So if it's VDI, I can do something different from it, it's a normal desktop. Is a laptop, I can do something different from the normal desktop. Um, this session and client rules here are all based around RDSH and VWU. So you'll be able to pick and have different rules based on the actual client they're connecting in from. So you have all those rules there. Um, you can do lots of flow control, you've got if then else, uh, environmental, so you can do time and day. If they log in after hours, you can build the environment totally differently than if they log in during work hours. Whole heap of things. If you're a bit of a scripter, I imagine there's some scripters in there. So you can type in a, a custom condition. So based on the output of this script, you can then do some actions. There's a whole bunch of actions here. So you've got file and folder, you know, copy folders, synchronized folders, pair of folders, all that stuff. Uh, drives and printers, we get called in a lot to do printers. So we have printer mapping and things like that. Volume printing and all that. You can do root policies, so we get used a lot to replace root policies. Case in point is uh, this one here. So there's a government organisation called Agima who set out all the policies you need to use if you're going to use Windows 7. Uh, the same thing is you can actually implement all those root policies and take five minutes to log in. Uh, when we set up the Department of Defence, we put all these policies in to lock in the Department of Defence uh, build that we built for POC. Um, and it took six seconds to log in because we're able to do those in the background rather than in parallel. Okay, what's a great little control there? So let me just finish off by showing you a little node where I was. Okay, so that's, this is the actual part of Access, which is doing that little party trick with Excel. So if the user processes Excel, I want you to set that registry value. Now, people probably don't know what that key is, so I could actually go in here and say, And then if I find blue.txt on the desktop, I want you to go into this, which is going to be like blue. So the next guy comes into there, doesn't have to really know what the key is, he just needs to know, okay, that's the bit that makes it go black, and then this other one is the bit that makes it go blue. Okay. Any questions on that? Just finish up. Well, I've known about this years ago, you quite have allowed it. It would have made my life so much easier. Exactly, exactly. Oh, I, I, in all seriousness, especially some of the, um, we've got the ability to do lockdowns on things like um, uh, Office. So you can drag and drop, let me just show you how to get over that just to finish off. So if I grab that, let's grab a little, uh, little thing here. So if I go and grab lockdown and uh, just grab a dumb note. So let's say I want to log down some elements of this application. I can just grab this little wizard straight over the top. Quite a long way there. It says, hey, there's a menu. And when I release my mouse button, it says, what are your items you want to black out? And just tick the boxes and grade those items out for you. You can drag and drop it over any button and make the button disappear. That will read any version of Office. The latest version we just released two weeks ago does Office 2013 365. Drag and drop it over the top of Office. You can lock down any button, any menu item, any tab. Push it out to a specific group of users. Pick someone who's a real pain in the ass about printing and say, right, take the printing button away so they can't print. 
just as that one user. Do that simply. Pretty cool stuff. Right. Any last questions? That's about it for me. Yes? Just one. Could the government, can you lock out USB access? Call the government can lock out USB access. We used to have a USB uh, lockdown feature which we have what they call in the software world deprecated for the product, which means we don't use it anymore. Uh, I've got government customers running it on the old version, but this new version, it's not there anymore. You want to talk to uh, Lamicha, or the guys that do uh, USB lockdown, awesome product. That's what they do really well. I worked for Defence and they went down and bought the plastic plugs in all the USB ports. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> good fun, that's the defense solution. Right. Um, one more, didn't they? Yeah, sorry, Shane. With, when you say set printers, etc., based on environmentals, yeah. can you then within that printer set defaults for the printer? So, say, if user logs on, I want to set their printer, but within the printer, I want to set them to double sided printing, black and white only, etc. Uh, yes, I can say, for example, when the guy starts the invoicing application, and if he's a member of the invoicing group and he's on floor three, I want this printer to be set to tray three, which is where the invoices are by default. And as soon as he shuts down that app, I want it to go to default back to another printer if you want that. So you can do that based on the process they start, where they are, whatever you are making. Pretty much do anything. Just right out of the use case, we'll be able to do it. Cool. Now, unfortunately, I won't be able to join you guys for a bit because I have a sick wife at home, so I'm um, Shattered by that, but I haven't paid for it all, it's all paid for. So please go enjoy. Now, one last little thing for beer um, if you, I've uh, leave some cards up here. If you grab one of my cards, if you send me an email and you tell me what your favourite beer is, I will personally come and deliver an accent stubby holder with a stubby of your favourite beer to you. Okay, so. It's a tough challenge. I know it's a tough challenge, but um, I'm happy to accept that challenge. Right, let's just. Uh, Thank you very much, Shane. Um, please, thank you, Shane.